Kids, I want to tell you a story from one of my favorite books of the Bible, and that is the story of Cain and Abel. You know, sometimes when we read the Bible, we sometimes wonder why God cared, kids and adults, about the things He cared about. And the story of Cain and Abel is one of those st- stories for some people. Now, a long time ago, there was just this one couple named Adam and Eve. Maybe there was a few others because... Well, we don't know their names, but we know that someone got married and ran off, and, and so they just they had a person somewhere. But Adam and Eve, they had to leave the Garden of Eden. Kids, you focus with me? All you kids? Okay. And they were very sad about disobeying God, and they asked God how they could show how sorry they were. So God told them they could show Him how they felt by sacrificing a lamb. And they did. After a while, Adam and Eve, they had two sons. Okay? How many of you know the, the name of, of the first one? His name was Cain. I see that hand in the back. What was his name? And, well, Adam and Eve had two boys. What were they named? Pumpkin. Cain and Abel? Yeah. Um, She knows, I know she knows, because she has two parents that are sitting on her leadership team. So, um, 
Call, I know she knows. It was the gallery pressure. It's all it is. It's okay, honey. You did fine. Look at Mary. She's so red. This is adorable. This is adorable. And their second one, their second boy was named Abel. All right. Now, Cain was a farmer, so he grew vegetables, guys. Do you guys have vegetable farms? Do you guys have uh, gardens at home? Any gardens? Yeah. Okay, all my adult children are raising their hand. And one. Okay. All right. He grew vegetables and he grew grains. Do you know what I learned about corn the other day? Corn's not a vegetable. Because people walk around, corn's my favorite vegetable. It's not a vegetable, is it? It's a grain, isn't it? It's a grain. But it's still my favorite vegetable. Anyway, Abel, Abel was a shepherd boy. He was a shepherd. And he looked, looked after the family's animals. And Cain and Abel, they were like most brothers. They didn't always get along, but... They were loved each other very much, even though they would fight every once in a while. Do you guys have fights sometimes? Keep your hands down, adults. Okay, kids? Yeah. Yeah, we, I, I, I grew up with four brothers, and we would fight sometimes, like when we were together. So, you know, that's why we have siblings, to learn how to get along with one another. And Adam and Eve was their mom and dad. And Cain told Abel about the message that God gave them that they should sacrifice a lamb to God to show how much they appreciated all He'd done and how sorry they were for their sins. And Abel was very concerned about this because he wanted to he wanted to give God the very best he could to God. So he chose his first and his best lamb and he offered it to the Lord God. And it was hard for Abel because... He gave up his most prized possession. Any of you have pets? Do you have pets? Now, you love your pets, right? Could you imagine if I knocked on the door and said, do you like your pastor? And you'd say yes, because all the people behind you do. Yeah, think about it. Okay. Could you imagine if I walked up and said, I want to keep your pet? You wouldn't like that, would you? But that's what Abel did. He gave his very best animal. And it was important to him to do his very best as God had asked. So Cain thought his little brother was a bit silly for giving his best lamb. Are we paying attention to the front row, adults? I don't need an answer, just asking a question. Okay. Good grief. Good grief, he thought. We need that lamb. God doesn't need it. I'm sure, now this is Cain talking. He didn't think that much of God. I'm sure he'd be just as happy if we gave God the runt of the litter, the sickly little one. We got a three legged lamb, right? We can give that one. Right? Why does he need a lamb at all? I'm a farmer, and it's been a great year for my wheat crop, and I can't use everything I, I've grown, so I'll tell you what I'll do. Because we have to sacrifice these things. We have to burn them in a fire. So why don't I just burn some extra straw I have? I mean, that way I won't be wasting in any by giving it to God. Now, for some, Cain's reasoning might sound pretty good at first. Hmm? Doesn't it? So Cain watched as the lamb burned up completely on the altar while his leftover straw just kind of smoldered and never really caught fire. And that could only mean one thing back then is that God preferred Abel. Well, they pre He preferred Abel's sacrifice. And Cain was jealous. And he didn't take the time or the responsibility to realize that it had been his decision to sacrifice the old moldy straw because the difference in God's response to their sacrifice was just that. So instead of trying to do better, do you know what Cain did? He got angry at his brother. And Cain asked Abel to go for a walk with him while he was still angry. And Cain struck Abel and hit him to the ground and he killed his own brother. When Cain realized what he had done, he was more concerned that someone might have seen what he had done than sorry for his brother's death. So he looked around and he sighed a breath of relief that nobody was nearby. Because nobody likes to get caught, do they? And then the Lord spoke. Cain, where is your brother? Cain's like, I don't know. I'm not my brother's babysitter. God replied, he said back, 
Cain, how could you be so cruel to your only brother? He has done nothing but try his best for me, for his parents, and for you. Cain fell to the ground, sobbing. Finally, he realized the horrible thing he did. And he had to live with the feeling and the knowledge that he'd killed his little brother for the rest of his life. Now, there's a whole lot of stories we can go on about this. I don't know what Phyllis has planned, but maybe she'll mention it a little bit. If not, she will now. I know that. That's what good children's ministers do. Okay? All right. Kids, you're dismissed. We'll see you. And we're going to go talk about Adam and Eve's children, Isaac and Joseph and Cain and Abel. You know, it's odd. It's really weird. We all know the story of Cain and Abel. Honestly, Genesis is probably one of my favorite books. I love it to pieces. But if you notice about the story of Cain and Abel, Cain gets all the press. He does. Cain gets all the press. Well, he gets more of it from Scripture than, than Abel does. Cain is mentioned in only 18 verses. However, Abel is only mentioned in 11 verses. Less attention. But the press that Cain gets, it's all pretty much bad press. Right? He's a bad man. He's an angry man. He's a murderer. God tells us in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, it says, Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother in your notes. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his, bro- and his brothers were indeed righteous. Cain's actions were evil? Yeah. Well, here in 1 John, we're told that Cain's evil action led him to murder his brother. In other words, Cain's evil actions didn't start with murdering his brother. His evil actions came before the murder of Abel. And that's the way most murders happen now. Someone just doesn't wake up. It does happen, but most of the time, someone doesn't wake up and go, this is a good day to murder. Yep, good day to murder. No. It's usually got some pent-up anger, some emotions, some jealousy, some rage, right? Now, some people believe, and I want to help set this straight, that Cain knew that he had to offer an animal sacrifice, but because Cain refused to obey God in giving the animal sacrifices, that's what made his actions evil. Well, the problem is, that's not what the story says. I know we get that somehow, but somehow, but that's not what the Word says. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 and 5 tells us, now Abel, now listen carefully and watch. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a worker of the ground. He raised uh, crops. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. Do you know what that means? This is my best fallen face. Okay. Do you read anything in there about God asking for an animal sacrifice? No. In fact, Abel is the keeper of the sheep, so he brings sheep. Cain is the worker of the ground, so he brings crops. Each of them bring what they've raised to give to God. So, if each one of them brought what they raised as sacrifice, why would God accept Abel's gift and reject Cain's? I don't know, but if the problem isn't with the gift, what does it have to be, boys and girls? It has to be with the giver. Does that make sense? Huh? It's not the gift. It's the heart of the giver. Oh, this is where it gets good. See, down through Israel's history, God repeatedly rejected sacrifice from the Israelis because they were 
because there was something wrong with the giver and not with the gift. Do you understand? In Isaiah chapter 1, verses 11 and 13 and, and 15 through 17, God says, I've had enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fattened cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or the lambs or goats. Bring no more, this is what gets it, futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. You getting this? You're mixing it up. You're making it dirty. When you spread your hands out, as in praise and praying, I, hide, I will hide my eyes from you. And even though you make many prayers, I will not hear your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil from your doings before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. As you can clearly see, it's not the gift that makes God upset. Can you imagine me knocking on your door and saying the following? I made you a loaf of bread, but I really don't like you. I made you this loaf of bread, but I really don't care for your wife. I made this loaf of bread for you, but your kids need work. Come on now, the Word says. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The problem for Israel wasn't with the gifts. The problem was with the heart of the giver. God was calling them, clean yourself up, then bring your offering. Jesus said essentially the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. Then go be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. The problem wasn't the gift. The problem was with the giver. Now, The Bible doesn't say what was wrong with Cain. But we have a hint. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is for you. Some some versions will say its desire is to master you. Or to rule over you. But you, God says, you must rule over it. Genesis 4, 6 and 7. In your notes. Cain's sacrifice was rejected at least in part because of his heart condition. Does that make sense? You wouldn't want something for me if I had something against you. Right? Cain's heart wasn't right before God. And so we're told in Genesis chapter 4 5, God had no regard for Cain and his offering. Did you get that? For Cain and his offering. But Abel's heart was right before God. Genesis 4 4 tells us that the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. So, what is it that made Abel's heart right? Before God. This is where we can do some application stuff for us. This is why you're here. It was his faith in God. For by faith, the people of old received their commendation. Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as what? As righteous. God commended him by accepting his gift. Hebrews. Chapter 11. We call it the Hall of Faith in Scripture. All right, And the whole chapter in Hebrews 11 is dedicated to showing God's people, to showing people whom God commended for their faith. In other words, He held up all these people and He said, these are the ones you want to be like. And the first name 
in that hall of faith in that chapter is who? It's Abel. Now let's just pause for a second and let's think about it for a minute. If Abel's sacrifice had been rejected, ooh, what do you think Abel would have done? Well, I think he would have tried harder the next time. In fact, that's what God tried to get Cain to do. God told Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Genesis 4-7. You know what he's saying? Try again. You can do better than this. By contrast, Abel's objective was what? Not to get out of it, but to be pleasing to God. And that's what his faith was about. Pleasing God. Too many of us come thinking, I need to be pleased. Okay, let's not use that word. But I need to hear the right music. I need to hear the right sermon. I need to have the right temperature. Why are those fans on? Do you understand where I'm going? Huh? When are we going to get carpet on the floor? Where's the air conditioning? Huh? How come we don't have asphalt all the way around the church? Hmm? Huh? Hmm? Where's our carport for the wintertime? That would be cool. Huh? Do you understand? I, I'm, I'm, what are they saying? I'm using absurdity to make a point. I'm hoping you're here to learn from God and to please Him with your worship. Not that we're trying to earn His favor because He loves you already. Do you understand? Faith was the real difference between Cain and Abel. Cain's sacrifice was all about him. Did you get that? It wasn't about faith in God. Cain's sacrifice wasn't a sacrifice of faith because God wasn't the object. Cain was. Do you understand the difference? The difference is, and I'm not after anything, but listen, the difference would be, now how much can I give and still be able to buy? Here you go, God. Instead of going, I, and I'm not after anything. I'm really not. I'm trying to get the Cain and Abel thing out here. Where we're trying to do some sorting as Cain and Abel goes, it's all yours. It's all yours anyway. It's all yours. What am I going to do with it? Right? It's all yours. And so when his offering was rejected, Cain got angry. How dare you reject my offering? But I don't think Abel would have responded like that if his offering had had failed. Abel was a man not driven by what he can get away with, but he was driven by a heart and faith of God, in God, by a a desire to please God, no matter, again, what the cost. What's it take to please God? You know, uh, yesterday I put out on Facebook, we have a a number of people in Messenger, uh, that is, uh, online, who are part of what's called the New Horizons uh, church group and, and we put out prayer requests. If you want to be part of that, let Mary know and we'll include it on you or something. We'll figure out how to do that. Mary, it's a good thing you're here so you know you got to do that. Oh, you're on vacation so you can't do it. Um, talk, to, talk to Heather. Where's Heather? Heather? Heather's on staff for the next week. You can talk to her. Um, but you know what? I put out there that Karen's back was hurting. Please pray. You know what I got? I got a phone call from Kim. What can I do? That's just willing to help no matter what. And I'm not trying to raise you up or blow smoke, but that meant a lot to me and to Karen. All right? And that's what it should be like. Our faith shouldn't be about our imposition, but our faith should be in your notes, or on the screen that is, should drive us to try to please God no matter what the what. No matter what the cost. It doesn't matter if you're tired. It doesn't matter if you've had a rough day. It doesn't matter. What matters is I've got a Heavenly Father that's crazy nuts about me. So much so, He gave His Son for me. I just want to say thank you with my very life. And not between 9 and 10 or 10 and 11 on Sunday. It's a life. Someone once said that real worship is thirsty land crying out for rain. D. Bradley said real worship is Focused on God and pleasing Him. And we should live a life of worship. Worship is not an act. A worship is a life. Now there's another thing about Abel that he didn't do that much at all. 
Do you notice that about Abel? He really didn't do that much. Noah. Noah's in the list. He built an ark. And he saved creation from the flood. Moses. Moses went down into Egypt and led God's people out of captivity. Joshua led people into the promised land and conquered the mighty city of Jericho. David faced Goliath and built a mighty kingdom for God. Great men of faith doing mighty deeds of faith. But what does Abel do? What does he do? He just makes an offering. He just makes an offering. This is important. It's, it's not a big deal. No mansions are built. No giants are felled. No city walls are destroyed. Abel just makes an offering. And then, what does he get? Abel gets top billing. He's the headliner. When Hebrew 11, 11 tells us of all the great men and women of faith, God mentions Abel first. Well, why? Well, because God and the world have two different ways of judging greatness. And I want you to take this one home. The world judges your greatness by your deeds. The world believes that how great a person is depends on how much they've accomplished. If you don't get much done, you're not worth much. But God doesn't judge greatness that way. In your notes, God judges our greatness by the size of our faith, not the size of our accomplishments. And someone in the church said, Amen. That's why Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 tells us, without faith it's impossible to please Him. You notice it didn't say without great accomplishments it's impossible to please Him. It's just without faith. How, how small? Mustard seed. Small, small faith. And watch it grow in Him. To please Him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. Now notice, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, tells us two things. Without faith, you can't please God. And second, faith means that, that you not only believe that God exists, but you believe that God rewards those who seek Him. Check that out. Did you catch that? That they seek Him because they believe He will reward them. You know, Jesus said something like that in Matthew 6.33. But seek first, what? God's kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. That's faith. That's faith. Faith is when you seek God because you know He appreciates that. And it's probably, I would guess, the most healthy thing you can do in your life. You don't have to do something great. You don't have to do mighty deeds or accomplish great things. You just have to seek to please Him. There's nothing more precious than a drawing that a five-year-old has made for you. Isn't it something that something can be worthless and priceless at the same time? That's our God. That's the way He looks at us. Warts and all. Now granted... If you seek God, you'll do all you can. You will. And you'll try to do great things for a great God. But most of the time, folks don't do great things. They try. They try. And once in a while, they'll hit that ball, but most of the time, it's a swing in the miss. Have you ever... Let me just share something with you. To me, the greatest game in the world is baseball. I love baseball. It's just an amazing game. I love baseball. And back where I used to live in Dearborn Heights, Michigan, on Saturday night you could go to a ride and they would have, you know, they would have baseball games. Or Saturday, that is. They'd have baseball games all around the towns. I, I don't see them that much anymore. Maybe they still do at the rec center. But every place that had a ball diamond had a little league team there. We actually had parades for our little league teams. But have you ever been to a Little League baseball game. Have you? They are the best things in the whole world. Okay? Hello. At that young age, they're still trying to figure things out, aren't they? Young kids stepping up to the bat, and often they look like this when they're standing there. They're holding the bat like this, waiting for the pitch. They're, they're, 
like, no, buddy, you want to put it up here and get ready. You really do. And you want to choke up a little bit because you don't have any arms yet. So you need to, you need to do this. So they're kind of standing up there like the young man. And the audience, the audience is who? The audience isn't the crowd. The audience is the parents. That's who's there. And no matter what, what do they do? They cheer. Right? I was the biggest embarrassment to my kids they ever had in their whole life. I might still be. I don't know. But once in a while, a boy or a girl, they'd stand up to the bat and you could tell someone had spent time with them. Right? And they stand up to the bat and he holds it right. And he gives it all he's got and he swings and he'll miss. And you know what the parents do? They shout, Great swing, buddy! Great. Did you see him swing? I know it was this far away, but did you see that swing? It was the best thing in the whole world because it doesn't matter to them whether he actually hit the ball. The point is he tried and he tried with all his might. And that's what God's looking for. He loves you that much. Someone who will swing for the fences And even when they missed, because they gave it all they had. But it's not the number of your deeds or the greatness of your accomplishments that God looks at. Instead, it's the why you did what you did. Why did you swing? You know why I swang at that ball with all my might? Because my dad's out there watching me. My mom's out there watching me. Did you do what you did because you loved him? I've had some amazing people do some things for me as a pastor because they love me. But it would be a terrible shame if they didn't do it because they love him. Right? Amen? Okay. Because see, that's what God's looking for. And that's why Abel got top billing. Think about it this way. Jesus took his disciples to the temple, hello, and watched as people put their offerings into the offering plate. For us, it'd be that little box sitting over there. And Mark chapter 12, verse 41 and 44, tells us about many rich, rich people putting in large sums. And a poor widow came by and dropped in two copper coins, which make about a penny. And he calls his disciples to him and he says, truly, I think it would go like this. Guys, take a look at that. You see that woman? Let me tell you the truth. I say to you, that poor widow has put more in than all those who are contributing into the offering box. Did you see her do it? It was amazing. For they all contributed out of their abundance. They did that. Remember I pulled out and see what I could sift through for God? But out of her poverty, she gave everything she had. All she had to live on. It wasn't the size of her offering that impressed Jesus. It was the size of her faith. And her love for God. And that's what God's trying to get us to see right here and right now. When He put Abel first in the hall of faith of Hebrews chapter 11. It was the size of Abel's faith, not his accomplishments, that God wants us to focus on. So, we focused on Cain and Abel. But what about that sacrifice? Huh? Genesis 4.4 4 tells us the Lord had regard for his offering. Hebrews 4, for Abel and his offering. And Hebrews 4.11.4 4 says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice. Or a little translation, I know it's kind of weird to sound, but Abel offered much more sacrifice. Much more. There's something about Abel's offering to God that, that God wanted us to see. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, it says, through Abel's faith, though he died, he still speaks. Abel still speaks? Yes. So what was it that Abel said in his sacrifice to God that he wants us to hear? Well, what God wanted us to hear was this. Jesus. Jesus was Abel's sacrifice. Now, I don't mean that Jesus had to die twice. 
No. What I'm saying is, is that Abel's sacrifice pointed forward to who Jesus was and what Jesus did on the cross. So what did Abel sacrifice? In your notes, a lamb. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1.29 Secondly, Abel raised sheep so his family could be clothed with its skin. Did you know that the Bible teaches to us that before the flood, humans were veterinarians? I'm, let's see if you're paying attention. What? Oh, vegetarians. I want to see if you're paying attention, that's all. That before the flood, they were, vet, they were vegetarians. They didn't eat meat. So the only reason to raise sheep was what? Was for clothing. And the New Testament tells us, teaches us that Jesus' righteousness covers our sins. Galatians 3.27 for as many of you were baptized with Christ, you have put on Christ. So when we stand before the throne of God, we will not be dressed in our own personal righteousness because Isaiah 64, 6 says that all our righteousness are what? Filthy rags. So who wants to stand before God in filthy rags when we can stand before God wearing the righteousness of Christ? Because we put on the lamb. Number three, Abel sacrificed the lamb. He killed the lamb. It had to die in order to be offered to God. Jesus came to die. He came to be our sacrifice for sin. As in 1 Peter 2.24 tells us, Jesus bore our sins in His body on the tree that we might die to sin and to live righteousness. By His wounds we are healed. Number four, Abel sacrificed what? The firstborn of his flock. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18 tells us that Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. Jesus was the first to rise from the grave. That's what that means. He was the first one to rise from the grave and to live forever. So why is this important? Since Jesus rose from the dead, we know that we can rise too. That's what baptism is trying to teach us. We are buried with Him and then we rise with Him. We imitate the first one, Jesus, to rise immor immorality and, it, and it's by His resurrection that we have the promise of our own resurrection. Romans 6, 3 and 5 tells us, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death. In order that, just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we too have been united with Him in death, like His, we shall certainly, I love the word certainly there, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. Isn't that great stuff? Are you with me on this? You ready to go home? I'm about done. But it's great stuff when you think about it. So what are we to think about as we take, take it home? Uh, what's, the, what's, what's the drive? What's the talk on the drive? It is, how's your heart? How's your heart? How's your, how's your sacrifice? I'm kind of still living for me. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. If you don't believe who you're living for, just ask your spouse. Okay? I'm not trying to start a fight. Okay? But if you come back angry and it's my fault, I'm sorry right now. Okay? But who are you living for? Do you know that we're called to die daily? That means we're supposed to live for somebody. Who? Who? We're supposed to live for Christ. I want to put on His righteousness, don't you? I want to bring the sacrifice that doesn't matter, but the gift. The, uh, the gift doesn't matter, but the giver does, because he doesn't look at the. He doesn't. He doesn't look at the stuff. He looks at what's pounding in your chest. Let's bow our heads right now. No one looking around. Just a real quick question. I'm not going to do anything weird here, but I, I want to ask. 
Now, for some of you, you know, I don't even have to finish the question when I say, how is your heart? You know that. And if you're saying, Pastor, you spoke to me today. God spoke to me today. Yeah, I come to church. I, 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 I do. I'm not a giver. I'm not a sacrificer. I come to church. Or maybe I, I, I give, but I don't feel it. You know, I don't, I don't give out of my need. And I'm talking about time. I'm talking about helping people. I'm talking about serving. I'm not talking about the box. I'm not. I'm talking about a heart that's open for God and willing to be used by Him. Now, if I've talked to you today and God's spoken to you in your heart and you say, you know what? I need a new heart because this one isn't pulling, my own, pulling the weight that it should. If that's you, just lift your hand and I want to pray for you. Anybody. Amen. Anyone else? Amen. 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 Look at that. Front and back, right and left. Everyone else is just right there. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you for those of you that raised your hands. That's not an easy thing to do. It takes vulnerability. But it also means that you recognize where you're at and and you want to be prayed over. Anyone else before we pray? Amen. Thank you. Yes. Anyone else? Amen. 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 Oh my goodness. All right. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, many of us have given gifts to you, but maybe our heart wasn't in it. Maybe we've come to church to bring, quote, a sacrifice of praise, but we didn't do that either. And Lord, maybe we need to die daily so that we could live for You. And there's probably more days that we live for us. It's a tough place, Lord, to recognize that we can still be a mess. And we can. And we think we've come so far, but we know in our hearts we're not. Lord, as my friends are praying right now, help them bring to their minds right now the areas in which they're holding back from You. The areas. Is it with my time, talent, treasure, whatever it is. Maybe my temper's got a hold of me so bad that I can't be loving. I need to get rid of that, Lord. Would you take that from me? Father, maybe I'm somebody that just can't seem to release a grudge. And I'm jealous, very much like Cain. And I do want your favor, Lord. I don't want to be saved. I'm already saved because I believe that Christ died for my sins. But Lord, I just want to put a smile on your face. And if I can't bring one to my own face, I'm I'm not sure I'm bringing one to yours. Lord, the areas in my life where I'm falling short and falling apart, would you pick up those pieces and carry me through this? Help me to draw close to you because that's the healthiest thing I can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, I'm glad I came to church today. Aren't you?